Let us pray. Heavenly Father, our Lord and our God, we come once again to worship, to praise you in your most holy and divine name. We thank you, Lord God, for this new day. We thank you for your people. We thank you for the promises of your word. And we thank you for your presence that's with us right now. We pray, Lord God, in the name of Jesus, that your spirit will prepare our hearts and minds to receive truths of your word that we might not sin against you. But our eyes might be open, that our weaknesses might turn to strengths, that our fears might be transformed to faith. And Lord, we'll be so ever thankful and so careful to give you all of the glory we pray and ask these blessings in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we're coming close to an end of our Black History Month and uh, knowledge of Miss Sarah Green again. For, and uh, Brother Deacon Green, Green I'm, we're not going to leave you out, brother, wherever you are. And uh, all of those that God has blessed to do great things as our people. But also we want to recognize the standard that he has done. And um, the thing is, is that our days of our years are numbered to three score and 10. It's temporary because of the wrath of God on our sins. But when God sets up a standard, it needs to be recognized because we didn't do it, God did it. And God has set up a standard and um, one of uh, the father is not here today, but the mother is here and I wanna recognize uh, daddy and mother mansion. Uh, daddy is 91 years old. Now that's a standard in itself because the word of God says some will get a little more time. And I'm not going to tell you how old mother is because she'll get me if I told that. But uh, she's close. And um, dad is not probably not feeling well today. He's not here. But I just want to recognize a standard because the standard is this. Is they took a covenant vow before the Lord in marriage 70 years ago. Let's give that a hand. Now you can go to a thousand churches and not find the grace of people staying together under the covenant of marriage for 70 years. Most of us not even living that long. Amen. So that is a blessing and uh, we want to recognize them. They um, are just like us, but they can tell us so many things about living with God in marriage because they have experience. You know, word and doctrine is one thing, but experience is where real truth lies because it's embedded in the soul. And they have children that they've raised and things that they've went through in life and I, we're just thankful to have a standard in this house. Amen. Amen. And as I continue, uh, my sermon was inspired from that. When Pastor mentioned that maybe about a month ago, uh, I just started thinking because, you know, those of us that are married, you know, I'm coming up on 26 years, and I know that's just one-third of what they, almost what they went through. And, and I know that marriage is, is work. You know, you have to work at marriage, you know, and all times are not happy times. And the devil gets busy with children and relationships and the divisions among us as a people. 
So my sermon is directed toward that today, and I want to first acknowledge my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ as being the head of my life, and all of the uh, my pastor, Reverend Jacobs, for giving me this opportunity, uh, all of the ministers of the gospel, Reverend Kaya, uh, Reverend Holston, Evangelist Shirley Holston, and all of those that might be upon, among us today, and also my loving wife, Frances, which continues to love me unconditionally Amen. by faith. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Amen. And she's, she's been a, a, a stone, a, a very solid stone in my life to a rock that I can depend on. Right. And I'm thankful for her. I praise God for her, as well as all of my brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus today. Uh, the scripture uh, that we want to come from today is in the book of Ephesians. Let us stand for the reading of God's word. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Darkness. World. Against spiritual wickedness in high places. Amen. You may be seated. The Apostle Paul was concerned about believers being equipped to fix whatever was broken in their lives. This morning I want to talk to your understanding about the one thing. For so often there are many things that divide us, but it's often the one big thing that initiates division in our relationships, our marriages, our families, on our jobs, and even in our churches as Christians. That's why I titled this message this morning, The One Thing Revelation. So I want to talk about the one thing in creation, the one thing in the church age, the one thing in the last days, and close the message with the one revelational blessing that God has given us as his people. I solicit your participation as I point up to repeat these words. It's all about the one. His name is Jesus. Now you can say it out loud. You can say it to yourself. You can say it quietly. However God leads you, amen. In creation, the word of God teaches us that what's really going on in our lives is a battle that sits on the outside of time and space, but determines what happens inside time and space. However, before we go a little deeper, we have to be clear about a foundational truth, and here it is. There's one God that has one plan, and that plan is his kingdom agenda. God's only plan is his kingdom agenda, not yours. So for those of you that want to be happy, independent, and financially stable all the time, your struggle is for God to bless your agenda rather than fulfill his. Because heaven always and forever rules earth. So if you are not in contact with what's going on up there, you ought not be surprised with your struggle down here. But if you are in contact, and you're still struggling down here, then you can be sure that God will give you 
what you call the peace above all understanding to get you through what you're going through while you're struggling. Because in this world we have three heavens. The first heaven is the atmospheric heaven. Our surroundings, the earth, and the environment in which we live. The second heaven is the stellar heaven. Outer space, where the stars and the planets and the angels exist. But the third heaven that the Bible talks about is the throne room of God, which is, by the way, an incredible busy place because it's the control center of the universe. Scripture tells us in Ephesians 1 and 3, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. So all of our spiritual blessings come in heavenly places. Now I'm just going to highlight these scriptures. You can read them while they're noted. But the highlight on Ephesians 1 and 20, it says Christ is seated in heavenly places. Ephesians 3 and 10, The principalities and powers that we war against are in heavenly places. And since it takes a good angel to beat a bad angel, angels bad and good are in heavenly places. But not only that, Ephesians 2, 5, and 6, even though when we were dead in sin, God has quickened us together as a church and has raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So we're in heavenly places with Christ. And even though you're living down here in the natural with people, your war your battle is not in the natural, but in the supernatural up there in heavenly places. So what's important for us this morning is to learn a different way. There was a eight-year-old boy and his family moved from Georgia to Washington, D.C. And then he met new friends and they were getting him acquainted with the surroundings and the school that he was going to. And no matter how accommodating people try to be in those things, there's always one that want to test a new kid that's coming to town. But the boy was surprised that when they would pick a fight with him, that he could land a punch in Georgia, but never could land a punch in D.C., and he just got beat up all the time. Finally, he got sick and tired of being sick and tired. And he prayed to God, God, send me some help. So the boy that was quiet, the quietest boy in the classroom, he, God sent him as an angel. And he said, ask your mother, can you come over to my house? I want to show you something. So little behold, he went down into the boy's basement and had a whole basement set up with boxing arena. His father was a professional fighter. And he showed the boy a concept of slipping and weaving. Now, the boy was raised right. He wouldn't start a fight. He didn't pick on nobody. He left everybody alone. But the next time somebody confronted him, life became much easier because he had learned a different way. God's kingdom agenda is to get you to fight your battles on earth as it is in heaven. And even though we all have a sin nature and people can get on our last nerves, sometimes you have to get on your knees to remember who you are 
and who you belong to. Because to win the battle of a mind, you have to practice truth. Because the Bible says, and they will know the truth, and the truth will make them free. Because it's all about the one. His name is Jesus. So here it is with our first parents. The one thing that happened in creation started with Eve, but ended with Adam. When Adam and Eve was created, God revealed himself by the name Yahweh, which means master, absolute ruler. And so anytime you read in the Bible and see Lord with all caps written in the, in the front of God, it means Yahweh. So when you look at Genesis chapter 2, the whole chapter is filled with Lord God did this and Lord God did that. But when you come to the beginning of chapter 3, when Satan had his first conversation with Eve, before he told her that by eating the fruit she wouldn't die, before he told her that her eyes would be open and she would be like God, he did one thing. He stripped the word Lord from the word God, reducing the authority to God to the concept of religion. What Satan did was he weaved around Adam the authority, did a slip on Eve, and God came looking for Adam because Adam was held responsible for the authority. He forfeited for to Eve. But, and, and what really happened is both of them allowed the human point of view to override the spiritual point of view, failing to do the one thing that God had asked them that pleased God. Because it's all about the one. His name is Jesus. So when we look at the church age today being the period of time from Pentecost to rapture, we are now living in the day of the later seeing church, which is in Revelations 3, 3, 15, 16, and 19. Let us read those verses. It says, I know thy works, that the... Amen. So now we have uh, understand that God loves the sinner, but he hates the sin. And a lot of people in the natural, we can look at people's lives and say they come to church, but we know they live in a sinful lifestyle. And it seems like God just keep on blessing them. Well, God does not bless the sinner to continue to do more sin. But what he does do is give the sinner mercy in the provision of time so that the sinner can gain a spiritual consciousness and repent before the Lord thy God. So the Christian knows what the end of this warfare is going to be. So the mindset based on scripture is that we are never fighting for victory, but always from victory because the victory has already been won. God gave us victory through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on Calvary. So the battle that we are battling is in the mind of faith. That's why 2 Corinthians 10, 3 and 5 tells us, although we walk in the flesh, we don't war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down the imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. 
So the church is to do battle from the throne room of God, from the point of victory, which is in heavenly places, in the mind of faith. And we to do that on earth because everybody is looking at us to be an example of God's people that represents heaven. Amen. So with that being said, lukewarmness is the one thing that God has issue with the church. And here it is, is when we vacillate in the mind. Now, there are some of you who might not be familiar with that word. Vacillate is when we are alternate or waver between different opinions or actions. In other words, indecisiveness. To understand this better, vacillation is the reason that most men can't shop and go to the mall with their wives. Because what the men cannot understand is the joy of a woman having a girlfriend and to be able to go to the mall and have an all day vacillating experience. You know, they go to one store and they say, I like this, but you know, the store over across the other side of town had one just like that. Let's go look at that. And they look at that one and then they come to the decision together. Well, you know that these are going to be marked down 25% in 10 days. So let's just watch it, girl, until they come. So when they come home, they might be happy, but they don't have nothing to show for it. And men have a hard time understanding that. But the women are happy because they had an all-day vacillating experience. Without this, without Homer tapping them on the shoulder to say, are you ready yet? Amen. Now, it's one thing to have a vacillating experience with your girlfriend, just your own private me and you time. But when it comes to spiritual warfare, it has no place. And James, the brother of Jesus, proves it to us in James 1, 5, and 8. It says, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth in all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given to him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, for lie that wavereth, for we that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the mind and tossed. He said, for let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord, double-minded and unstable in all his ways. See, he says, double-minded and unstable. In other words, what Satan wants to do is to make you so unstable that you just become a spiritual schizophrenic. You know what schizophrenic do. They just go all over the place. And see, that's the way he wants you to waver between uh, the decisions that God is speaking to you. Wavering. Because wavering is vacillating. Being double-minded. And James is telling us that when we face our difficulties in life, you have to ask, in a certain way. You have to ask with faith, without doubt, because it causes the church to be spewed out with lukewarmness because it's all about the one. His name is Jesus. Now, for the next 25 years, this country will be led by the millennial generation. The oldest millennial to this day is 39 years old, born in 1980. And this generation is characterized as the all it's about me generation. The generation of entitlement to where vacillating, viewing cell phones, and vaping is the DNA of the day. But the Christian has to remember 
that they've been transported to another place with Christ Jesus in heavenly places. So entitlement is all about you belongs to Lord God, master, ruler, because it's all about the one. His name is Jesus. And when we look at the last days here, 2 Timothy 3, 1 and 4 tells us these words. Read that. minded lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God see you don't raise up standards like I talked about earlier you're being lovers of pleasure and of yourselves you have to love God so that God will lead the way amen and all of us that have kids we see uh, more and more children being so disobedient to their parents when the fear of the Lord used to be back in them of the day and no matter how bad they would be on the outside, when they came home, they had a respect. And they stood up and said, yes, sir, yes, ma'am, and do what the parents tell them to do. But now you have rebellion. And it's, it's not just one family. It's all families have, are seeing this in our world because Satan is raising his ugly head. He's on the loose in these last days. This also is referenced in Ephesians, uh, in Revelations 2, 1 and 4. Now, it says that until the angel of the church of Ephesus write these things, say if, uh, go ahead and read that for me. to remember that the Ephesian church was the church that had things together. You know, they, just 35 years earlier than that, the Apostle Paul was always thanking them for their deep faith in Christ and their love for the saints. Because even though they kept the second generation, they were the second generation the older generation had passed on. Many of them had got old and were dying off. Now the younger generation was coming in to run the church. And we see this is that although they kept a purity of the doctrine of the life and the service of the people, they were lacking in their deep devotion in Christ in their worship. In other words, they were lacking power in their praise you know those that just want to clap one time and sit down you see because they were led by feelings instead of faith see God wanted a spirit in his house not just truth he said to honor me in spirit and in truth he wants the spirit and we got we got a lot of doctrine in churches we get truth all over people get truth and walk on out of here but we want spirit because spirit God illuminates the truth makes it real to you so that you can go and live it out when you are warred against okay and at that time you know it comes to a thing of uh, spirit intentionality spiritual intentionality 
And just to give you an example, it's like when you get up on a Sunday morning, you think about John 3.16, God so loved the world. Then you go to the horrific death that Christ served on the cross. Then you start thinking about those close calls that God brought you out in your life where he came and showed himself like a miracle. Then you go through the simple blessing like your children are healthy and your, your wife or you might have somebody to fix you something to eat and you got a car to ride the church in and a roof over your head. The common thing you think pretty soon praises start coming up inside of you. Then you get on in your car and you put on some gospel music and by the time you get into the parking lot, you got a praise on your lips. And you get out of the car and you got a pep in your step. Now you might not pep like you used to, but you can shake the left leg, shake the right leg, hop up and keep it moving and come on in a church with a spirit of praise. Amen? God it is asking his believers he wants the believers hearts of worship as well as their heads and their hands he said go back and do the first work not by feeling but by faith that is worketh by love amen as I prepare to close I need you to understand what a fortress is a fortress is defined as a stronghold a person or thing that's not susceptible to outside influences. You see, what the devil wants to do is in a time when you're relaxing, he wants to come up in your living room or your den and get in your big chair right beside you and start making suggestions to your mind. And he wants to do this long enough until you have speculations and you set up strongholds in your mind. Once he does that, he just spreads out the partition. And you know what a partition is when you was in the trailers and had two classes and the teacher would just spread out the partition so he can divide one class from the other? Well, Satan wants you in his class while Jesus Christ is on the other side so that he can keep setting up the stronghold. Well, there was a man one day that was sitting in his big chair and the demons came in to visit him and he says be gone demons he said I rebuke you in the name of Jesus he said by the authority of Jesus in me I rebuke you in Jesus name you must flee and the demons looked at him and said wait a minute hold up back up he said now we know Paul we know Peter and John and all of us know Jesus but who in the heck are you? And the man didn't have an answer and the demons jumped on him and beat up his spirit. And the reason that happened is because the man had no authority. You see, you can be religious. You can put on the show, you can perform the act, you can say the words, but authority comes from relationship. See? When you have relationship, you get heavenly assistance from heavenly places, from the throne room of God. Hallelujah. Now, all of this was concealed in the old dispensation, but now it's revealed in the new dispensation. The, old, the one revelational blessing that God wants us to know in the old. It comes from the 91st Psalm. It says that he that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Now, the secret place is in the presence of God. And even though he's omnipresent, he operates from the throne room in heavenly places. That's why Hebrews 4.16 says, come boldly to the throne of grace to obtain mercy and find grace in the time of need. Then he said, 
you shall abide. Abide is acting in accordance to the rule of God. But you know, today we don't like rules, so you can't abide. And then the word says shall abide. Shall is future tense. That means you might not be abiding right now. But as you keep on dwelling in the secret place, one day you shall abide. Then he said, under the shadow of the Almighty, that's protection. He says, I will say unto the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress. A refuge is a shelter. God is a shelter to us in a time of a storm. A fortress is a stronghold in the mind. Now all of this was concealed in the Old Testament because the old saint didn't have the evidence of the New Testament. All they had was God. And God was their substance of things hoped for. And God was their evidence of things not seen. And they just went on God alone. And that's why one of the reasons that God called them the heroes of faith. And the New Testament, he gave us John 14, 23. And I want you to connect the dots here because Jesus said in John 14, 23, amen. Amen. Jesus answered and said unto him, if a man love me, he will keep my words and my father will love him and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. See, abode is a place of residence, a home or a house. In other words, when you abide by the rule of God in the spirit, God the Father and God the Son will come and make their abode, make their residence in your soul. In other words, if you abide, God and Jesus will reside. They will get in your big chair and make a fortress, start speaking to your mind so that you can have church all of the time. And the word will become flesh and it dwelled among us. And we beheld his glory because we dwell in the secret place of the most high. And the Bible said a thousand of the evil angels will fall by our side and 10,000 by our right hand but none of the evil angels will come near us because God has placed heavenly angels charge over us because you have set your love upon me I will deliver you but not only that I will set you up on high because you have known my name he said call me up I will answer the line will never be busy. He said, call me up when friends don't treat you like they used to. Call me up when loved ones are not around. Call me up in the lonely midnight hour when you need somebody to speak to. He said, call me up on the main line. I'll be sure to answer you every time. And the Bible said, with long life, I will satisfy you with a long life if you walk by faith and not by sight you might get a little more than 70 91 92 100 years old by faith not by sight I will show you my salvation glory to God for he is faithful glory to God he'll never let you down keep God in first place and keep him as your first love God bless you such a way I couldn't just sit there and need Jesus in my life I tell you after hearing the word hearing it spoken in such a way if you need Jesus today we have counselors here that can help you walk through 
to learn who he is and how he can be a, a means to the way, to holiness in your life, to direction in your life, and to salvation. And so if you're here today, we want to offer you the road to salvation as we ask you to stand and we offer the counselors to come. If you need a, a church home, we offer that too.